a deep dive every week with activists, artists, and experts on the front line of struggles that we are facing now in this COVID moment. Thanks to those who have joined us online today for a live discussion that will proceed after we talk with our very special guest today. And thanks also to those who are watching via live stream on Facebook and will be watching on YouTube soon. Uh, thanks also to the sponsoring organizations, Socialism and Democracy, Hardball Press, Labor Press, and Encuentro Cinco. Our show today, our third ever show, focuses on the very crucial theme of condition critical, frontline nurses and organizers, and organizers in the midst of this COVID pandemic. Here in Massachusetts, I know we have over at this point in time, 2,000 recorded official deaths due, due to COVID, 1,000 of which, over 1,000 of which, have been recorded in retirement communities and nursing homes. Today, we have with us two special guests and a special co-host. We're very lucky to have today with us Trey Kwan from New York, uh, an activist and organizer with the New York State Nurses Association and also an editor and writer with the magazine Left Voice. Hey, Trey, how are you doing? Hey, Joe, doing okay. good. Thanks for having me. Nice to see you. Thank you for making time for what, what must be a very busy and stressful schedule. We also have with us Jesse Martin, who is Vice President of SEIU 1199, where he has worked with others organizing nursing home and health home health aid workers. Jesse, thanks for being thanks with us. Thanks for having me. Great. Uh, Today, we'll also be throwing a little wrinkle in the show. Uh, Tim Sheard, who's always been, already been one of the co-hosts, or rather the co-producers of the show, will be joining as a co-host. Tim Sheard from Brooklyn. He is a retired nurse who has worked in hospitals for 40 years. He is the author of 10 medical mystery novels and also the founder of Hardball Press, which publishes working class stories. Uh, yeah, we get some Hardball Press here at people in the house, it looks like, which is great. Uh, Tim is also, as I said, and Hardball is also a co-sponsor of the Shelter and Solidarity Program. Uh, Tim, how are you doing in Brooklyn? We're doing okay, Joe. We're, we're hunkered down and we're doing okay. Thanks. All right. Well, Tim, it's really great to see you as always. And uh, we're going to let you take the lead on this first, uh, these interviews, considering your longstanding work in the, the healthcare industry and your, and your knowledge of, of some of the guests who are joining us today. So take it away, Tim. Thank you so much, Joe, and hi to everyone watching and listening. I want to start out by asking uh, Trey and then Jesse, um, what are the conditions like now in the hospitals that you're seeing? What are you seeing? What are you hearing from your coworkers? And not only the conditions in the hospital, what, but what are the conditions of the workers? What kind of physical and emotional toll has it taken on them as well as on the infrastructure? So Trey, if you would start, start first, if you would, please. Sure, Tim, thanks. So this pandemic has been um, has been a real drain on all of us working in the hospitals, in the clinics, EMTs, folks on the front line. Um, we we've had a really hard fight for protective equipment, masks, gowns, gloves, face shields, uh, and we still have a huge challenge going in the Health and Hospitals Corporation, which is known as a public sector in New York City, for example, expects nurses to wear one N95 mask for five days or five shifts, and that's up to 60 hours. Tim, since you've worked in the ICU for a lot of years, that's unheard of. I mean, you're wearing your mask, you're sweating, snot all over it, putting your gloves on that mask to remove it, to get a drink of water, God forbid, or to take a break and have a sandwich for lunch, you're supposed to put that soiled mask right back on your face and come back with the same thing. So this, I mean, it just really shows how little preparation or how poor the preparation was to begin with. But beyond that, you know, we have patients who are so critically ill. Um, it feels like we're running around and there's not much we can do because we have um, poor, there's not enough staff who've been ICU trained to care for these patients. So a lot of staff have been kind of thrown into the situation, are very anxious, afraid that they're not able to give the right care, uh, don't really know how to medically manage those patients. You have so many nurses and, and doctors, techs, nursing assistants who are out sick because of unnecessary exposure to the coronavirus that of course that 
has exacerbated already the chronic staffing shortage that we were dealing with before. Um, emotionally, I, the, my first shift back, when I went back um, after maternity leave, my charge nurse was sobbing when I walked in because she was so stressed about our unit being dislocated and placed in a totally different part of the hospital, about not having enough staff that night, about what we could do to protect ourselves from being exposed during intubations. I mean, the level of stress, people talking about not being able to sleep at night, thinking about their patients, um, seeing our patients die alone uh, in the hospitals, no family to hold their hand, no family to just be there and to say goodbye or even to mourn them after they pass. And that has caused, you know, during a huddle the other day, my charge nurse was saying like, well, we've not been able to account for, maybe we're reaching a peak, maybe the expectation is we're gonna go back to the terrible normal, but um, we're still gonna have to process this. We're still gonna have to deal with the secondary provider trauma. Um, and going back to normal is nothing to look forward to. There was already so much nurse burnout. There was already so much disillusionment with working in a healthcare system where you're not able to care for your patients in the way that we really want to. Yeah, thank you, Trey. I know when I started out of nursing 42 years ago, in the evening, every patient got a back rub. When is the last time a nurse gave a patient a back rub in the hospital? will link time and are there resources for them once we pass this the worst of the crisis are there resources for them to get the kind of emotional help that they'll need i i see two roads in dealing with the uh, the, the burnout um, and the disillusionment that this episode is causing there's the corporate solution or the management fix um, which is, a lot of us might be familiar with have like company yoga sessions that no one can make because we can't even go to the bathroom or we have what they call chai time where someone from the management will come with cookies and tea meanwhile we are running around coding patients and being like we don't have the resources we need to do the work that we want to do so there's that road and i think i think very little of of that um of that fix to the emotional and physical costs. There's the collective strategy though. Uh, and I think the best therapy for me now and for a lot of us nurses has been to fight back. Um, we are organizing really hard in our facilities and also citywide trying to talk to nurses in hospitals around, around the city, people we can reach upstate as well, um, to try to coordinate our struggles, support each other, how did you build a committee at your hospital? How are you talking to your coworkers and, and the doctor? How are you convincing the union to back your organizing? Um, what do you do when the cops come around and try to break up your pro? So in a way, we're we're a little ad hoc, unfortunately, because um, we're not seeing on the national level union leaderships really jumping into this and throwing all of their weight and force behind direct action and mobilizing so it's been kind of up to us to figure things out all rank and file initiative but in the end even without the blessing of our our union leadership sometimes we we're totally um, inspired by our own kind of ability to come together and even win partial victories. So, I mean, I don't think that's been my therapy. How do you move forward if we don't have, if we, if we can feel like we do have power as workers, we're not just victims to go in and be martyred. Uh, whether by the Trump administration, Cuomo, de Blasio, or anyone else. Gotcha. Well, your courage and your dedication has inspired all of us, and we're immensely grateful for this work that you've done. Jesse, can you tell us a little bit about conditions in the nursing homes where you are in New England, uh, conditions of the homes 
and conditions of the workers there who have to go to work, want to go to work, want to care for their people. Sure. Um, you know, in Connecticut, you know, I work for 1199 New England, Connecticut and Rhode Island. Uh, I work directly with um, 7,000 nursing home workers in the state of Connecticut across 60, 69 facilities, 61 of which have COVID positive resident populations that our members are caring for. And that amount spans between maybe one or two residents in the nursing home to 100% of the residents in the nursing home. Uh, for example, today I was notified of one of the smaller nursing homes we represent is a 60 bed facility in Orange, Connecticut. Um, they had up until 72 hours ago were, had no COVID positive residents. And as of today, they're 100% um, COVID positive. Um, the, really the conditions of the membership and the residents is quite tragic. Um, you know, the nursing home industry in Connecticut and around the country has been um, historically underfunded for decades. And many of our members, CNAs, um, LPNs, dietary workers, housekeeping workers, laundry workers, make minimum wage or just above. And, and the level of protection that they have in PPE is quite atrocious. Um, you know, in our nursing homes that we represent, we first started seeing COVID positive residents at the end of March. Um, and within four weeks, you know, it's um, over 50% of all the nursing homes in the state of Connecticut have COVID positive residents. And of the last data that's come out from the state, um, which was last Tuesday, 56% of the statewide deaths have happened in nursing homes. Um, despite having four weeks worth of fighting this virus, um, many of our members are still using trash bags uh, for protective gear, um, literally cutting holes in them so they can just see through them. Um, face shields, gowns, masks are extremely hard to come by. Um, we have several nursing home operators that are using that are on their 21st day of using the same PPE, 21 days straight. Um, and well over 10% of our membership of those 7,000 um, are sick actively with COVID. We as an organization had to have a number of members pass away um, from COVID that they've contracted in their workplaces because of a lack of PPE. Um, you know, this just affects really every ounce of work, both physically and emotionally, that our members um, do in the nursing homes. Um, you know, with treating people with COVID, there's a significant amount of breathing issues. And nursing homes rely traditionally on um, oxygen tanks to be delivered to the facilities. Um, and one source of spread in nursing homes are elevators because they're uh, kind of a, a, a social funnel, right? You know, you can't socially distance in an elevator and people have to use it to get up and down into the facility. So this week I was notified that an operator turned off the elevators. And so that left nurses aides, um, you know, who are in their 50s and 40s and 30s, uh, carrying 100 pound oxygen tanks up multiple flights of stairs to get it to the patients. Um, and it is just atrocious. It's, it's a real breakdown of the, um, the idea that we are supposed to take care of those who are most vulnerable in our society. And um, when we allocate state funding, which most nursing home residents in the entire country and particularly in Connecticut receive uh, the funding to pay for their for their stay in, in the nursing home through Medicaid 
which is a state source of, of funding. Um, the state has constantly, in Connecticut, has only increased Medicaid rates a handful of times in the last 20 years. And I can say that the only times that they've increased it is because the membership of 1199 has either threatened or successfully gone on strike. Um, and, you know, we're seeing, um, since this began over four weeks ago, we've had um, quite significant amount of wildcat strikes at nursing homes. Um, many members, um, reporting to work, but refusing to report to the units until they're given protective gear. Um, that's happening as of even today. So, um, you know, the members are relying on the direct confrontation with their employers to make sure that they are accountable to the working conditions that they are creating. Um, but also we are engaged in a, in a real um, dialogue with um, the entire uh, state of Connecticut about getting relief from the state government, uh, particularly funding to help provide appropriate uh, support for these workers who are um, dying, along with their residents. Um, the emotional toll is just, uh, it, you, you can't, I can't really summarize it. Um, when many of our members take care of people who don't have other families to come and visit them, and many times um, you know, they are seeing very large um, amounts of deaths. And when you're working with and caring for the same person for a very long time, these are long-term residents in the nursing homes, they provide them birthday cakes when it's their birthday. They um, support them when they're having tough times. Um, and um, we've had some nursing homes report that in one shift, they're being on one assignment seven or eight residents passing away. And it's just uh, emotionally devastating for our members. I know having met many of your wonderful uh, caregivers in New England, um, Jesse, I know that they, are, they get very, very close to their residents. They have such long-term uh, relationships with them. Now, those of us, you know, all of us are activists in different ways. We are all trying to fight uh, for better working conditions, for uh, more equipment uh, for allocating resources where where they where they need to go, but it's difficult now with all this um, isolation uh, being set in place, not being able to gather together and uh, tell us against the governor that you had not long ago, eleven ninety nine organized. It's a good example, I think, of how we can still put some pressure on 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 the administration. There's still ways to do it. Yeah, so, you know, one way was we created a, care, a caregiver's caravan of uh, members and activists from around Connecticut over uh, really five or six blocks worth of cars, which people individually decorated with um, homemade sheets across the front of their vehicles like masks and um, uh, homemade signs and things. and. We left the union um, union office and circled the Capitol, which has a um, a circular driveway that, because of the shelter in place and at home, um, there's no traffic. So we uh, had kind of freedom of access to the roads to almost do what we liked. Um, and you know, unbeknownst to me in reality, but we uh, timed it at the same time as the governor was doing his evening press conference at the Capitol. And you can hear the note, you can hear the car, the car horns and the loudspeakers and uh, Bob Marley playing quite loudly um, on his uh, Facebook live feed. Um, and, you know, we're going to continue to do a lot of um, actions associated with that, particularly for next week, um, and continue the pressure on, on state officials. Sounds good. Trey, I know your union, the New York State Nurses Association, has had some very dramatic uh, demonstrations in front of hospitals. 
where they've held up photographs of their coworkers who have died as, ex as a result of exposure. Tell us about some of the things that, uh, some of the organizing tactics that you, you've used and how has it buoyed uh, your work, the nurses, has it given them uh, any, any emotional support by being, going out there and, and really let, letting people know what's going on? Initially, there was quite a bit of trepidation around organizing public or direct actions. Um, sorry, let me see if I can. Um, because of the social distancing um, decrees, and we weren't sure to what extent this uh, state of emergency that Cuomo declared would be enforced, um, whether or not there would be any use of um, state force. Uh, as we're seeing in, in the global south and particularly in Latin America. Um, so there was, there was some fear, you know, um, but with Jacoby Medical Center where rank and file nurses organized their first speak out action, um, keeping six feet apart, we saw that the overwhelming response by even bourgeois media, um, but more importantly, the public was that folks were sympathetic to frontline workers. They wanted to hear directly from us what was going on in the hospitals, not only because there was um, concern for our conditions, but there's obviously a concern for the safety of patients and the care that folks were able to get um, in our oversaturated healthcare system now. Um, that, I don't know if it buoyed folks, but it definitely, um, motivated others, myself included, to carry out similar actions, calling attention to the, the fact that we were dying on the front lines because of a system that was failing to protect workers, but expected us to keep showing up at work. Um, Tactic-wise, pretty um, straightforward. Uh, there wasn't a lot of scripting or a lot of prep most of the actions were prepared two days before they took place so usually we'd have a week to mobile up nothing like that uh, much more uh, particularly folks in the rank of file who've been most active in the union fighting for safe staffing all along or fighting against like despotic management um, were the first to come forward and and be willing to talk to the press, which can be a scary thing for workers. Um, I think one important thing to point out is NISNA statewide leadership has embraced these actions, but it wasn't like a top-down um, planning. It, it really did come from individual members and kind of the militant minority in the union that has in the past really pushed for strike action um, and for more work, more workplace mobilizing versus legislative um, or lobbying road to um, to power. Trey, if I could jump in on that, actually, um, I mean, it seems like you're, you're both you and Jesse have pointed to you know you've mentioned the possibility of of striking not necessarily now, but in terms of healthcare workers in general. And it, it seems to me like one of the challenges, I speak as an educator who's in also in kind of a caring field, right? You would say like whenever teachers go out on strike, people say you're hurting the students, right? So I wonder if you have you, and also I'd welcome Jesse to speak to this, reflections on both the particular challenges, right, of trying to organize for power when literally people's lives are depending on you continuing to go to work, right? I mean, it seems like it simultaneously has made frontline nurses a kind of powerful, almost vanguard of the moment, right? People, people on the front line who also have medical expertise about the broader situation, but also put you in, I don't want to say an impossible situation, but a very challenging situation. How can you continue to embody those ethics of serving the people and also play the role of like uh, protesting and strategizing? So I guess my question is, how have you, what tactics and strategies or even philosophical kind of thoughts have you had about how to navigate that tension and also for those of us listening and watching who are not on the front lines in that sense, what can we do? And I speak as a member of a union myself, what do you think can be done to amplify and to support you all? I mean, you're out there sometimes with your six feet protest, six feet apart protests, and Jesse mentions a caravan. What could be done to mobilize the broader array of workers, organized and non, or unionized and non, not the same thing, to really uh, put pressure on to support you right now 
but also looking forward. And, and I guess, uh, and we'll talk about the bigger picture in a moment, but I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, both, both kind of big picture and um, concretely. Yeah, Trey, you want to take that? Sure. I'll take a stab and definitely yeah. want to hear Jesse's thoughts. Um, in terms of the, the dilemma of striking when you're caring for people, um, when we had a, a really big push for almost 10,000 nurses to go on strike last year, I got to say, I think the patients, the patient population we care for in East Harlem, they were probably the most in support of the nurses. Huh, really? As patients see what we're doing, um, they see, I have patients tell me, have you taken a break yet? <laughs> I was eight months pregnant and running around, not able to, you know, stop often enough to get water. So I ended up being super dehydrated and having to go out earlier. And my patients would be like, you're doing too much. Like, please have some food. Patients understand that their care is contingent upon like our well-being, us being able to have safe conditions, have enough patient, enough nurses to, to be there for them. Um, if you have people who are exhausted and drained, you don't have folks able to snap um, in a moment when there's an emergency situation uh, or to have clarity of thought when there's, you know, a, a, a code or something where you have to definitely be on your toes. Um, so strike two, it's a, it's a larger question of strategy for the labor movement. Uh, and I think in the time of a pandemic, Ironically, because they've staffed up so much with travelers, agency nurses, and they've closed down elective procedures, we've actually discussed among nurses that this would be a really good time to strike because you have enough staff on, on hand um, to take care of the people who are in critical need. You have people on board. Usually we are so short staffed that we have to, we have to be worried about having um, worker organized committees to be there to tend to emergency situations, which we've discussed. Unions can um, organize a force of nurses who are ready to deal with a stroke or to deal with a heart attack when needed, um, even in a strike situation. Um, the way teachers are there to organize food and meals for students and activities for students when they go on strike. Um, but what the question here is, you have um, one of the, like, a city with some of the highest rates of unionization in the country and the lowest rates of mass strikes. Why is that? You know, we have um, basically a, a, a union leadership, and I'm not just talking about NISNA or anything, but in general, that's really tied itself to the agenda and the cycles of like the Democratic Party, essentially, this idea that workers are constituents and the most we can do is put in our vote or endorse somebody instead of seeing our collective power and our biggest weapon, which is the weapon to strike, to, to disrupt production and profit in general. Um, and another problem is that a lot of um, Union officials see that their role is to actually team up with management. And I'm curious what Jesse thinks about the USA Today op-ed that was um, published some days ago with um, CWA, AFT, SEIU, and the Teamsters um, international leaderships thanking and praising all of the big corporations for supposedly putting protections into place for workers. Um, and instead of the reality, which is any gains that we make are because we are out there struggling, we're fighting, we're organizing, and we're forcing employers to meet our demands. And even then it's not enough. Um, so I think that whole attitude of like, um, the best we can do is see how much employers are willing to give us, or even we need to protect our employers because we rely on them for our jobs. When in fact, it's up to us to determine what's safe, what is the best care. Um, if it were up to us, the, the $2 trillion bailout for corporations would not have happened. It would have been towards working class needs and, and to deal with the actual pandemic crisis. Um, so really 
it's all about, you know, developing the confidence of the rank and file, the self-organization. And when we go into maybe what we can do ahead, we can talk more about a democratic workers united front type of thing to defend ourselves, but also to go on the offensive and think about, wow, this situation is showing us that even single pair kind of stops is a, is a limited uh, measure nationalizing healthcare, removing profit from the, from the equation altogether, um, making sure that industries related to healthcare, pharmaceutical, logistics, um, medical equipment and supplies, that those are also centrally coordinated so that there is not one nursing home worker, one hospital worker or clinical worker who has to use trash bags or to try to scramble from their neighbors and mutual aid networks to come to work and take care of folks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm glad to hear you make that turn. And I mean, what could you say a little more about what you think it would mean to go on the offensive? And could you also say a little more um, about the uh, power of collective action? I mean, you implied, and, and, and I believe it, uh, but I'd like to hear more about it in terms of how you've seen people transform during this moment. I mean, or, or perhaps that's too truncated a way to put it. I mean, I'm sure there's been an ongoing transformation of people struggling in the healthcare field for quite some time. But clearly, this is a kind of catalyzing moment in many ways, positively and negatively. Could you say a little more about, you know, what you've seen? And, and Jesse, I would welcome you to this as well. The, trans the way in which this crisis has catalyzed or pushed forward people's consciousness and their sense of possibility. Of course, there's the danger in a pandemic that all of our horizons get lowered, right? Because we're just glad to be alive, right? If we are and not be sick yet. Uh, can you talk about how we push back against that, both what you've seen yourself um, and felt yourself and also uh, what it would mean on a big picture level to really go beyond just, you know, universal healthcare, which is something we shouldn't even have to argue for, but still do, to, to, to the other kind of components. What would it mean to really have a healthy society or a society that could provide health care that people really need and deserve? Um, you, know, I, you know, I'll go, kind of go back to the first question about strike and then touch yeah. base on that. Um, you know, just a year ago, um, we were planning on striking um, over 25 nursing homes in the state of Connecticut across um, 10 employers. Uh, um, the history of our nursing home division here in Connecticut has been one of complete and utter militancy. Um, and that's why I, when I talk about wildcat strikes and work stoppages, um, though they were not authorized by union leadership because they had collective bargaining agreements that forbid such actions, the ability of workers to take that collective action on their own only came from their ability to have a workplace organization where they had leaders, co-workers who have leadership on every unit, on every department, on every shift in the nursing home. And you know, many times um, we are faced with the narrative that you mentioned of, you know, I even remember um, about eight years ago, um, I was helping to run a strike at five nursing homes that lasted nine months. And in that fight, many times the employer um, would try to say, you know, real caregivers don't walk out. But in, in reality, every day on those picket lines for, for nine months, many of the residents came and ate lunch with the strikers. Mm -hmm. And it goes to the personal individual relationship that particular nursing home members have in the long-term care setting with the people that they care for. They know, the residents know our members' kids. They know their husbands. They know when they die. They know when they get sick. They know when they're worried about paying for Christmas gifts. And that deep personal connection trumps many times, not all the time, but many times, the corporate narrative in healthcare that workers shouldn't stand together and act collectively and shouldn't exercise the right to strike. 
because it hurts the residents. But in particular, in this day and age, dealing with the crisis now, many of our members more deep have a deeper understanding of the systemic um, racism in our society around funding for long-term care. You know, the vast majority of our members in nursing homes are women who are black and brown. And many of the residents that they're caring for are the same as them. And even in this fight for PPE, we can see that um, bureaucrats and um, companies are treating them as the visible people, both the residents and the workers. And taking these collective actions, whether it's an unauthorized work stoppage, is checking that narrative at the point of where labor is exchanged for wages. And um, I know I've had much deeper conversations with a number of our membership and their leadership in the nursing homes around we have to expand our demands politically to go just beyond what is the next wage increase that we can get. But how do we honor the sacrifice that many of our members have made, their families have made, our residents have made to change structurally the way that long-term care is funded and residents are treated and the workers are seen, not just shoved into an unmarked grave. And, you know, I think that the tool of strike is something that is appropriate and it needs to be used. And sometimes you need to use it just for the sake of reminding all the other people that you can use it. And, um, you know, I will mention that next year, in 2021, all of our nursing home contracts expire on the same day, along with all of our home care workers, all of our state employees that we represent in healthcare, all of our community-based group home agencies, and all of our hospital workers. So 26,000 workers in the state of Connecticut, uh, represented by 1199 New England, will have the ability to join together um, during a budget year and also in coordination um, uh, with the last budget that the sitting Democratic governor does before he asks for our members to vote for him again. And I've been on several conference calls with some of the larger chains that we represent. And at the end of each one of those conference calls, the members tell me or ask, when do you think it's time to take the pound of flesh that we deserve? And I remind them of when their contracts expire. Jesse, um, you had, you had uh, brought an important point that the nursing home and home care workers that you represent for, for a long time have been unrecognized, unseen, unappreciated. They've been invisible workers. And many people have commented during this crisis that, that the, the public at large can finally see how critical it is the people who deliver the food to the supermarket, the people who set the food out in the, in the market for you to buy, uh, the people who, the postal workers who bring you your mail. Um, there's a lot of w workers, working class people that have been un, you know, undervalued because the, the administration and, and, the, and the, the leadership, of course, they want to tout all these images of the mighty entrepreneur. So we have this moment, I think, we have this moment where people can see how important work, workers are, working people are. So going forward, once we get past the peak, hopefully, we're going to get a downhill slide, people are able to get out. How can we mobilize workers like, like the ones you represent so that, they, so that they can demand their fair share, they, so they can seize their, the political power that they deserve? Jesse, if you would come in and then, and then Trey, if you would. I, again, I think it goes to um, we need to get um, the stories and the experiences of our members out to the broader um, public. And, you know, I know personally for me, this has been one of the hardest times in organizing workers. 
um, both um, using the tools of being an organizer for work for for healthcare workers, but also emotionally, and the ex lived experience of uh, the nursing home members and our home care members who, by the way, are also suffering from a severe lack of PPE, where this state of Connecticut has only provided them uh, on average with 2% of the necessary required PPE that they need to give home-based care to consumers in the state of Connecticut, um, is the key to expanding that fight. Because I, I think that as we, um, we're all focused on a daily narrative about who's sick and who isn't, who's getting care and where are they getting care. And this is touching more people across our country than the 20 year long war that we've been having um, and many of the other things that have been going on in this country. And I'm very hopeful that we can connect the experiences of um, traditionally um, um, silent communities of workers who are black and brown and women um, to the broader stream of communication across this country and fundamentally change some of the things that um, have uh, subordinated them uh, in our society. Back to Trey. Thank you so much for that, Jesse. It's really powerful. And thank you for also mentioning that master contract coming up in 2021. Uh, we, we definitely want to report back on that at some point. Uh, Trey, bringing it back to you, I know there's a lot on the table. Um, I had asked you, I mean, if you could elaborate on that too, thinking about how can labor, how can nurses, how can those who want to support healthcare workers go on the offense, not only now, but in the future. And also, if you could speak to that issue of how you've seen people transform in this moment through this struggle, right? Is, has this been a catalyzing moment? It sure seems like it has been for many medical workers and for broader public um, consciousness as well. But I wonder from the front lines, Trey, and Jess, Jesse, you could speak to this too briefly before we open it up to Q&A for the group. Uh, but Trey, I'd love to get your thoughts on that before we go to Q&A and certainly bring some new voices into the mix. Trey? Thanks, Joe. Um, I think that the level of desperation and the kind of the devastating circumstances themselves have pushed a lot of workers, even myself and the folks, the, the minority of workers who have come out, um, I guess risking maybe job or risking the, the wrath of um, unapproving local leaderships because this is a life or death situation. And I think as a, as a socialist myself, there was a lot of opportunity when you are that close to the fire and you see how the system's contradictions bear on your life, your family, your community, your working conditions. It's, it's a moment where in a way, all we wanna do is break free. And, and what we have to do is rely on ourselves and fight until the end. And that is not always the conclusion that people come to. Sometimes uh, folks come to the conclusion or become really demoralized, uh, feel really isolated and hopeless. And that's why having a class struggle union leadership is so important. Um, but also folks, um, we see how a lot of really powerful social movements in the past have become co-opted either by a nonprofit industrial complex or by the Democratic Party. And I'm always, you know, trying to discuss the idea that we are never going to be safe um, in a crisis prone system uh, where our lives do not matter as much as their profits, as long as um, movements, union leaderships, um, and the left pin their hopes on the Democratic Party. Um, even the idea that we can like have a clean break at some point or a dirty break and, and, and figure it out later. But for now, use the ballot line, use the platform, use the election cycle and kind of sublimate the labor movement or struggles in the community, in the workplace, secondary to all that other stuff. Um, and then, you know, 
the other major problem, and I, I'm like harping on this all the time, is as long as um, the officials who are supposed to represent us, the union leaderships or political leaderships, um, think that the well-being of workers is actually aligned with the bosses, I mean, we'll never, again, we'll never be safe. Another outbreak will come and workers will die. Patients will die. We will be exposed. We will not have the PPE. It's like, um, it shows how the for-profit healthcare system, so cynical, um, is looking for the highest bidders in order to sell the masks and the PPE. So it's not, it's not being distributed um, equitably or to the areas with the highest need. And in New York City, it's been really clear when over 30% of the deaths caused by COVID have been Latinos um, and almost 30% have been Black, African American or Caribbean. Um, it's it's a, a symptom of already racially segregated healthcare system where, you know, racism is absolutely um, a part of how healthcare is inequitably provided and, and organized. Um, so I, I, I think that how have we been transformed? By struggling and even making partial wins, we are building our confidence as a class. Also by seeing Amazon workers walk out and lead the way or seeing Target workers or Smithfield workers, undocumented folks, um, we're, we have to break down those sectoral barriers and sometimes like trade union barriers of like, well, I'm only worried about nurses. As long as nurses are good, then I'm good and whatever. That's totally false. You know, we, uh, Amazon workers are fighting for safety and protection so they will not cross contaminate. So there will not be hordes of workers coming to the hospital where we'll be flooded and overworked and drained and die on our jobs. All essential workers right now are like healthcare workers you know, MTA workers who, more MTA workers have died than healthcare workers in New York City. The transit workers. Transit workers, the transit. absolutely. Their struggle is our struggle. So we have to totally eliminate this, this notion, which is um, basically imposed and really benefits uh, the corporations and, and the capitalist state that like my interests are separate from yours. So this idea of a united front where we function democratically. We try to push our union leaderships to, for example, take on a May Day strike, walk out, call out, cancel rent, cancel debt, um, close detention centers, you know, more of like a working class platform um, to save our lives as people, communities, and not just our jobs. Um, and yeah. I think. If we take that, the more and more we fight and strengthen our muscles as a class, um, when, it's, when it is time, um, we go on the offensive when we talk about power in general and how that is un the imbalance of power in our society, the majority having very little say over our lives and a very tiny minority um, determining everything else. Uh, and I, I think I want to say really quickly that I'm all about struggle and the fight at the workplace. And I absolutely think we should not cede our best weapon of the strike um, to like lobbying or other tactics. But I also think that struggles have a limit. Um, they're, usually, they're usually localized and usually workers in struggle obviously are focused on, on their demands and their situation but we need something that can cohere and unite all of the struggles. And we really need a political expression for the working class. Like the Democratic Party right now is working with the Republicans to bail out corporations, you know? Um, they're not thinking, okay, how do we connect Amazon, Target, GE, GM workers and healthcare workers and nursing home workers? How do we unite that and advance that to yeah. social transformation? Yeah, Trey, that's really great stuff. And I mean, I, I one of the, humbly, as humbly as we can, as a, as a new project, we do hope, I think, with Shelter and Solidarity to precisely help to nurse and encourage and enable some of those connections within and across sectors, as, as, as you uh, point out the, the need of that. Okay, 
It is now uh, 5.50. We are running five minutes behind in terms of taking Q&A and comments. In order to enable multiple voices that have not been heard yet, I thought we could, rather than just ask one question and go back to the guests, we could take maybe three. If, people, if we have three, I assume from the 20 people here, we'll have at least three comments. If you, if you could try to keep your comment or question sharp, I mean, uh, and, and rather short, that's fine, but I know sometimes they need air to breathe. So maybe we could take three comments or questions from uh, our, our live audience. Thank you for being here. And then go back to the group and then maybe one, maybe one more round of questions, though we may be after six o'clock at that time. Okay, who would like to go first? If you could raise your hand or indicate. Um, okay, uh, Saren, could you call on Michael, please? Un unmute Michael. Um, okay, am I unmuted? We can hear you, Michael. Welcome. Okay, aside from the pain and suffering which I am hearing, the one thing which, one of the things which most stands out for me and which I'd like to hear comments uh, on is the fact that the leadership of the labor unions themselves are more tilted towards the corporations and the Democratic Party, et cetera, than they are towards the workers. And I'd like to hear some more comments uh, from that point of view. Thank you, Michael. Uh, would someone else like to speak? You can raise your hand in the uh, participants box or you can just physically raise your hand. We'll try to see you. Anyone else right now? Uh, I know Mary was asking if we had time for questions. Okay. Not seeing any. Let's we want to kick that back to the to the uh, team. I thought we'd have other questions, but uh, let's uh, kick that back to the guests. Uh, feel free to respond to Michael's question. Uh, Jesse, would you like to speak to that? I mean, maybe as someone who's working in SEIU, um, you know, I think, not to put you on the spot too much, but I wonder what your thoughts are about how the Democratic Party can be engaged in ways that is not co-optive, for instance, right? I mean, I, I sometimes say we need an inside-outside strategy that's anchored in the outside, right? But I don't know how you navigate or think about these, uh, these challenges of, of dealing with a, you know, a two-party system where, that, where both are kind of have many problems, to put it mildly. Uh, do you want to speak to this, Jesse? Sure. You know, I think that our, the way that the methodology that we kind of look at how political engagement can, uh, that we have to deal with as a labor organization that represents healthcare workers, or the primary source of uh, the way that they are paid through their employers is through state funding, state and federal funding. We have to engage politically because otherwise we are ignoring the way that our membership. Uh, as a labor leader is paid. But I think that the philosophy that we've had at uh, New England Healthcare Employees here in Connecticut, which is much different than other 1199s, um, uh, though we are under the umbrella of uh, SEIU, um, is first is building workplace power through on the ground leadership and development of uh, member leaders in every nursing home, in every work area, in community-based programs, and using that um, member leader power in, in a militant way towards and to leverage whoever is in power, Democrat or Republican, um, to act on the behalf of our members. And, you know, look, it, it is difficult many times, particularly in the Connecticut political world, where our governor is a hedge fund manager, his wife is a hedge fund manager. Um, there are too many conservative Democrats in the state legislature to move more progressive legislation around expanding uh, childcare and expanding um, you know, uh, healthcare for workers and low wage workers. Um, but the only real way to make any change of that kind, no matter who's in power, whether they are uh, friendly to workers' voices or not, is to have an organization that's built from a base of militant 
member leadership that can take action in a coordinated fashion to build power for themselves. And, you know, in nursing homes in particular, um, last year we threatened a strike um, with thousands of nursing home workers. We increased Medicaid rates that the increases had to go to wages. And that was not just in our homes. That was in every nursing home in the state. So we were at the point of the spear of a movement to get wages for the lowest wage healthcare workers in the state. Whereas otherwise, if we didn't have that militancy, no matter who was governor, uh, it wouldn't have happened. And so, you know, it, it is unfortunate we have to make some really poor choices between one party and the other. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that, Jesse. Uh, we have Sarah actually with a question for Trey. Uh, Sarah, you wanna, you wanna unmute yourself and, and uh, voice your question? Yes, um, I have a question for Trey. As a socialist, do you vote? And how do you convey your ideas uh, among your coworkers? And uh, what kinds of struggles do you have with them? Great question. Actually, two questions. Um, I, I want to go really briefly to Michael's question, if that's okay. Um, and then address Sarah's, if I can. Um, just because I think there's really important examples and concrete examples of um, what I think are major errors on the part of political or union leaderships. Um, so I think that this kind of, Mike Davis called it the barren marriage between the Democratic Party and the labor movement. And it's been since the 1930s um, where, you know, you have, what it means is you have union leaderships that don't speak out against imperialist policies, um, wars um, on other countries, because they're concerned about a piece of legislation that they're working on with those same uh, Congress members. Uh, you have in our, in the case of, I think, New York State, um, Cuomo is this uh, huge kingpin of austerity and neoliberal policy, but he's also the one who pretends to be like a pro-labor guy. Um, when the building trades folks were fighting um, for Count Me In, when they were fighting against um, the use of non-union labor to build the biggest development in the history of New York City on Hudson Yards, um, Cuomo didn't do anything to make sure that those jobs were safe and up to regulation and union. He said he would because he wanted to get those votes, but he didn't actually make sure that happened. He does the same with nurses where he says every election cycle, I'm gonna make sure we do something about that staffing shortage that you've been dealing with. Hasn't happened. So what we do is we compromise our independence and our, when we compromise our ability to actually mobilize and fight for those changes in our contracts or even force legislation because Congress cannot have nurses going on strike. That will be chaos in the city. We need to pass staffing now. They must really freaking need it. Um, but instead we kind of wait on them and we beg and we beg and we beg. And the, the mobilizing that the unions do is once a year you spend many thousands and thousands of dollars to take people on a bus to Albany away from our facilities. So we're literally thinking it's away from your workplace where you have power. Um, there's also this problem of um, in the union, the decisions, political decisions are not made by the rank and file at all. So I don't, I don't think that we should boycott the political process or, or leave or cede politics to the two parties or, or anyone else. I think that we have absolute stake in that conversation, but it should be democratic. It should be the rank and files truly engaged in making decisions for our union, who we're going to back. Um, in New York, for example, for any elections. Um, but that's all made in a committee behind closed doors, unelected positions in our union. They decide how much money goes to Governor Cuomo's next election. They're putting, you know, um, close to $100,000. $100, in this COVID um, pandemic organizing, I, I gotta say, you know, we were out there protesting in front of our facilities, the rank and file alone. I didn't see uh, any staff out there in, in a lot of those actions. Um, and 
that says a lot, you know, that says a lot in terms of the priorities um, and how much the priorities of the of the leadership right now. In fact, I think there's a lot of concern about offending Democratic Party politicians um, in anything we say or do. And I just think that that really ties our hands behind our backs. And what I mean by we need a political expression is we need a working class party. That is that does not we don't need we can't share the same house with our oppressors with our corporate employers. Um, with the people who are designing the catastrophe that we have today. Um, so I think that really understanding that concretely, um, that we need to have a working class party that is anti-capitalist to the core, because that is the interest of, of all of us regular folks. Um, and then in terms of Sarah, I'm really open about my ideas, as you can imagine. Uh, my coworkers, you know, whether they've been exposed to socialist ideas, Marxist theory or not, they know that I have their back, that when it comes to the fight against the boss, if someone is retaliated against, if, if folks, like that solidarity is, is the thing that I really try to um, represent and, and act on at work. So in a way it kind of opened up people to other ideas. Like we talk about Palestine, we talk about um, the, the U.S.'s imperialist interventions in Venezuela, you know, like it opens up other conversations, but they want to know like, okay, where do you, when it comes to snitching, <laughs> like, I mean, a lot of that stuff, um, uh, I think opens the door to, to other politics. And then I do not vote for any one who is running in a capitalist party. So I, I won't vote for anyone who's on the Democratic Party ballot. And I'm not, for me, it's not a moral question. I'm not gonna like defriend someone who, who chooses to vote for someone who's a Democrat, but I'm, I wanna have this conversation that we're having now. You know, what is the strategy forward for the working class? Oh, I think you're muted. So, oh, uh, absolutely. Um, thank you, Trey. Um, so I've, after conferring with my uh, fellow producers, we've decided we're going to go five minutes, 10 max for, for additional discussion. No, you did not go too long, any of you. This is really, really important. And Trey, at some point, after we hear from Mary, Mary has a comment for you. Uh, right, Mary? Uh, but I'd also like you, after Mary's uh, question or comment, to address this issue of, of where these conversations are happening and aren't happening, uh, as you, Trey, I understand since being on the front lines, you were picked up not only by Democracy Now!, you had an interview there, which is actually where I learned about you um, and met you uh, through a friend, uh, but also on like BBC and larger so-called mainstream, as you say, bourgeois media networks. I wonder if, if you might talk a little bit about how media framing and you know, in your own personal experience how you've seen the power of these news corporations kind of limiting the scope of what can be discussed related to this issue. Uh, so, but that's, I don't want to jump the stack. Mary, you're up. Um, hi, Trey. Can, can people hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, Trey, I was really struck. Uh, I also don't vote. Um, I'm a communist. Um, and don't see any benefit in it. But I was really struck earlier with your insight about the potential at this particular moment. It's, you know, sometimes you have to seize a very particular moment in time that all resources are going to the support of, of literally patients at the edge of life and death. And so the potential for a work action, the potential for the shock waves that would send through the system is really quite powerful. And I wonder if you could speak to how, how you could see that rolling out, because those are the kind of pivotal moments. You know, I was a public school teacher for many years, and we were always accused whenever we threatened on going on strike, you know, we're going to deny the children an education, da, da, da. Now, this is Rarely has the entire health profession been focused on something that is so life and death, and it seems like an enormously potential moment. And if you could speak to that, I'd love to hear your thoughts. 
Great, Trey, take it up. And then, uh, you know, Jesse, if you'd like to respond as well. Honestly, Mary, this is not a question that I've elaborated, you know, in a lot of detail because I think the subjective conditions in, in that like workers' willingness to strike on a mass scale in the hospitals today are not are not really there. Mm. Not really the mm. conversation um, that nurses are having organically, calling out sick or having the right to be sick even and, and recover from illness caused by the negligence of corporations in the state, yes. But most people are feeling very compelled to answer the call. Mm. Um, and I felt that pressure as well. Um, when, that was why I came back a little earlier from you know, maternity leave, because I felt like I, I needed to be there next to coworkers to take care of patients. However, at any given moment, there's only about maybe up to half of us on shift, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if there are 5,000 people employed at my hospital, maybe half or less. So the fact, you know, it's not just strike action, it's in general mobilizing, being on the street and taking action, even right. just organizing at our workplace to say, right. we're gonna decide um, what isolation protocols, what PPE, what kind of break system, what kind of relief system, what kind of quarantining and, and all that stuff is happening. That's also a form of developing our power and mm -hmm. confidence at the workplace. And I gotta say, you know, Amazon workers, logistics workers who are, if, if they are discussing call outs or strikes, that's something that healthcare workers, I, I believe we should coordinate and be with them in solidarity if we can. Um, I, and then the second question, Joe. Um, yeah, you know, I think I've I've been a little embarrassed even about the attention. I think because I what I had a baby, Maya was born January first, and I was planning to stay out uh, until May or June. You know, um, and I think that headline really caught on and. It's true, you know, being a new mom is so hard and having a baby in a pandemic is terrible. Having a child right now, childcare, all that stuff is so difficult. Um, and that I'm not like, that is real to me. And that is a major struggle for me and any other parent or grandparent, someone who takes care of a, a mm -hmm. child. Mm -hmm. But um, I kind of feel like, yes, like let's grab onto this story and let's kind of sensationalize it. and. And I think what it what what um, corporate media has done is um, fed into this idea that we are victims or heroes or martyrs, and that it's assumed that we're going to go in there and sacrifice ourselves for this mm -hmm. war against the virus. Mm -hmm. That goes for like grocery store workers um, and even farm workers who are don't even have equal rights as workers because mm -hmm. they're undocumented so mm -hmm. the federal government is willing to praise these folks but actually maintain this um, underclass of, of workers so it's totally bogus that that is a narrative that that um, erases the fact that you know me and my boss my boss the CEO of Sinai who is in his condo in Florida we are not exactly on the same side we're not dealing with the same problems. We're not working under the same conditions. Even if they offer to donate 50% of their paycheck, that's nothing because they actually get millions in bonuses and all this. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, I'm glad that um, when other people see that story and, and they relate to me because they're also going through that, that's cool. But I also know that um, we need to rely on, on our own press sometimes. That's why I'm like part of Left Voice. That's why I appreciate your podcast. We need to have control of our own narrative, really, uh, in our own language to describe what we're going through. I couldn't agree more. There's so much alienation, right? People don't realize the capacity and the power that we have, right? That we could have. And we're hoping to try to nur you know, nurture that. 
Uh, we are at 6.10, and I don't see anyone flailing about with a final question. Uh, you know, I do want to, uh, maybe as to return to, you, oh, do you have a question? Ziggy? Um, Ziggy, we'll give yes, you the last you. word, and then I, I was wondering Patrick if you Raymond, like, I had a, Oh, go ahead, had a, Ziggy, go ahead. I had a cultural contribution, because in every struggle, particularly in the African-American people's struggle, there was always song, poetry, and dance and so and this struggle there should be that and this is called it's capitalism baby grave diggers feed hungry heart island trenches plain pine coffins stack three high they rest side by side in solidarity for now they share island real estate with AIDS and 1918 flu fallen. New York is not new to this. Ask African burial ground ancestors. It's capitalism, baby. 799 died today, tasered with temperatures of 103.5 and shortness of breath, a bus driver, track worker, and a couple of conductors I know on site and speak to came down with chills. They breathe welding magnesium, steel dust, and diesel fumes decades for New Yorkers, yet they couldn't be tested. It's capitalism, baby. What if they whispered three little words, pleaded 12 times instead of 11, like Eric Garner, as the long, white, tatted arm of the law crushed his windpipe? What if they pleaded, I can't breathe 12 or even 13 times? Would they have been tested, treated, and alive today? That's not MTA's concern. Bottom line, liability, lawsuits are. It's capitalism, baby. Nurses slash garbage bags open, using them as PPE slash personal protection equipment. Docs reuse gloves and mask multiple patients in the world's richest country. It's capitalism, baby. Hand sanitizer was $15 a bottle yesterday, 50 today, if you can find it. Ventilators were $25,000 yesterday, $45,000 today, and climbing. It's capitalism, baby. If water is life, hand washing is a life saver. Unelected emergency management cut Detroit water off and poisoned Pennywise Flint. Oh, please, it's capitalism, baby. San Francisco hotel rooms sit empty, the unhoused shelter in place below freeways and in overcrowded shelters, and on cold convention floors. Oh well, it's capitalism, baby. Parasites self-isolate on swanky yachts, toasting tax breaks, looting labor's fruits, sucking up shares, senators, congress members, and blood. Leeches storm the Hamptons, hoarding, greedily buying meat, frozen food, filling extra McMansion freezers while working class shoppers tussle over toilet tissue or stand their ground and it's, it's capitalism, baby. Cars sob in food banks, lines stamped insufficient funds a mile long while farmers plow perfect cabbage heads and green beans back into black soil and ivory rivers swell from dairy farmers dumping millions of gallons of milk in manure pits, and chicken processors smash 750,000 eggs each week for profit omelet obscene food fights. It's capitalism, baby. Return to normal? That Titanic sailed months ago. It does. It does seem, however, that it left ashore 
capitalism's grave diggers. Thank you, Raymond Nat Turner. That was Raymond Nat Turner, one of our most cherished uh, poets and members of the National Writers Union. Thank you for that contribution uh, so much, Raymond. And I'd like to encourage people to read uh, uh, dispatches from the front lines at Labor Press, one of our sponsors. They're running a series of articles of uh, stories directly from the ICU in hospitals in New York. So we want to encourage people to to read them and check out Labor Press. Uh, back to you, Joe. Absolutely. All right. We're getting used to this co-host thing, right? <laughs> uh, I guess it wasn't Ziggy. Was it? So it was Raymond Nat Turner. That was amazing. I'm so glad we kept recording. Um, Raymond, if you could send that to us, we will post if you have a, I mean, we'll have the video, but if you would like to share the text, we'll post that and share that. Uh, that is just uh, so powerful. And I think it's really important that we keep the cultural, artistic component in view. After all, our show is called Shelter and Solidarity, uh, a deep dive with artists and activists. And one of the roles of art in a period like this, right, is to conjure a little sense of what might be possible, even though we don't have the uh, masses assembled quite yet. We have the words. We have the words, and the words point the way. I'd like to thank everyone who helped to make today's broadcast possible, all of you who joined us live, especially my co-producers, Tim Sheard and, and Seren Mudliar, and Kira helping him on the side, Kira Mudliar. I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, which include the journal Socialism and Democracy. I also want to, uh, another Socialism and Democracy member, Matt Callahan, uh, let us use the song named Shelter, which we opened the episode with, so thank you, Matt. Uh, Labor Press, um, Labor Press, and um, Hardball Press, uh, both with Tim Sheard's involvement and others involved in that. Thank you very much for your co-sponsorship of this project. Next week, we'll have a show on the battle for the future of higher education. We hope you'll be back next Thursday, five o'clock. We have some great guests trying to link up the different sectors in a united fight as we shelter together and extend our solidarity beyond. Uh, beyond our own kitchens or wherever we're, we're talking from. In the meantime, please keep safe, keep engaged, and keep together. See you next week. Thank you all. I saved the file of the this these things. So, so how do you?